Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. It's Tuesday, September 26th. This is The Gateway. I'm Wayne Pratt. After KDHX dismissed 10 DJs on Friday, others have quit in protest. Ital K said during his final show that leaders have created two paths for the station. One that they see that serves them, and a next one that serves you, the community here in St. Louis, that donate and support it. Two visions. Which one of them you want? Coming up, a conversation with St. Louis Public Radio's Jeremy Goodwin about the developments at KDHX. Also, we'll have another report exploring the concepts of home with help from NPR's Next Generation Radio Project. St. Louis activists are calling for officials to institute policies that would better protect city jail detainees following two deaths. As St. Louis Public Radio's Chad Davis reports, they are also demanding the release of more information to the city's detention facilities oversight board. Activists gathered outside the City Justice Center to demand city leaders fire Corrections Commissioner Jennifer Clemens Abdullah and that corrections workers stop using chemical sprays on detainees. The rally comes a month after two detainees died in the jail, including Terrence Smith. Smith's daughter Jasmine was one of two of his children to speak at the rally. She says he suffered a seizure and stroke after falling from his bed, but they still have questions. We need the help. We need the answers. We need to figure out what's really going on inside, what they hiding. A spokesperson from Mayor Deshari Jones says she's met with faith leaders and advocacy groups to discuss ways to improve the jail. I'm Chad Davis, St. Louis Public Radio. Nurses at St. Louis University Hospital have ended a one-day strike outside the SSM Health Operation on South Grand Boulevard. They are calling on SSM to provide more protections against patient violence and to implement safer nurse-to-patient ratios. ER nurse Michael James Block says many nurses at the hospital have quit. It's not a matter of finding the nurses. It's a matter of creating working conditions where they feel safe, where they feel cared for, and where they feel valued so that they will stay here and continue to work in these jobs. The local nurses have picketed before but have not called a strike since they unionized a decade ago. A Missouri Circuit Court judge has ruled against Secretary of State Jay Ashcroft's proposed ballot summaries of six initiatives to legalize abortion. Cole County Judge John Beatham's ruling says some of the phrases in the summaries, such as dangerous, unregulated, and unrestricted abortions, and the right to life, are problematic. Beatham has rewritten the summaries for all six proposed initiatives. Ashcroft's office says it will appeal the decision. The lawsuit by the ACLU of Missouri created another legal battle for this set of initiatives. In July, the Missouri Supreme Court ruled against Attorney General Andrew Bailey's claim that he had greater authority over a document estimating the financial impact of the proposed constitutional amendments. Lawyers for Southampton Community Health Care in St. Louis say a lawsuit by Missouri's Attorney General is a desperate overreach. The state is suing the clinic for providing transgender care without conducting mental health assessments. The Post-Dispatch reports the ACLU and Lambda Legal are representing Southampton. The organizations say in a statement that the lawsuit by Attorney General Andrew Bailey attempts to interfere with health care by using consumer protection regulations. The lawsuit claims a potential violation of the Missouri Merchandising Practices Act. A new law took effect last month on limiting puberty blockers and hormone treatments for minors, The newspaper reports Southampton is among the groups challenging that law. A Republican congressman from Missouri supports an effort to provide restitution to St. Louis area residents who become sick due to radioactive waste exposure. But as St. Louis Public Radio's Jason Rosenbaum reports, a possible government shutdown could affect negotiations over the proposal. Missouri Senator Josh Hawley was able to attach an amendment to a major national security bill providing compensation for St. Louis area residents who contracted illnesses consistent with radioactive waste exposure. Missouri Republican Congressman Mark Alford says he supports Hawley's amendment, but getting it through a conference committee he's serving on would require the government to remain open. If we don't have a working government, a fully funded government, we are not going to be doing conferences of any sort. We won't have availability of staff in many uh, situations. That's why I think it's important that we keep the government funded. Without congressional agreement, the federal government is slated to shut down on October 1st. 
I'm Jason Rosenbaum, St. Louis Public Radio. Mid-America St. Louis Airport in the Metro East will run an emergency training exercise this afternoon. The fictional scenario will simulate a plane landing hard, crashing into structures, and starting a large fire. Several area emergency teams will be involved. Airport leaders say such simulations are conducted every three years to comply with federal requirements. Turmoil at St. Louis Community Radio Station KDHX continues after management dismissed 10 DJs on Friday and told another 12 they have to complete a mediation process to keep their shows. Since then, some who had not been disciplined have quit in protest, a few live on the air. St. Louis Public Radio's Jeremy Goodwin has been following the developments at KDHX. Jeremy, we have DJs being dismissed, DJs quitting, some are planning a vote of no confidence. How did we get here? Wayne, it's really rooted in two things. A series of financial challenges the station has faced after its big move to a new location in 2013 didn't really work out as as planned, and accusations of racism at the station that were made in 2019. What are the most recent developments? Hours after the announcement on Friday, a longtime DJ Art Dwyer announced at the end of his show over the air that he was quitting the station. And a few hours later, another DJ did that, Ital K. And each of them had hosted their show for decades. So uh, here's some of what Ital K had to say over the air on KDHX. And I'll mention this is edited together from a longer statement. As I speak to you, I'm standing in a very, very dangerous position. And I know that I'm, I've been targeted from day one. So I feel that this is my last show here at 881 KDHX. I'm 61 years old, black Rastafari, locks down to my ankles, and I do know right from wrong. Station management dismissed 10 DJs on Friday, told another 12 they need to go through a mediation process if they want to keep their shows. What was the reason behind that? Something we heard in the remarks Friday that was different was the idea that, hey, the station is in the midst of this big cultural shift. It's trying to become more inclusive. And it turns out not everyone is committed enough to that. Now, this is a new rationale from what we've heard before. Management first had fired three other DJs early this year, saying they were part of a campaign to urge people to stop donating, and they do deny that. The language of the announcement Friday was that the DJs had done things that were detrimental to the station and its reputation. Board President Gary Pearson, speaking to me, was more specific in bringing up the alleged friction over DEI stuff. How did people respond to that allegation that they were not on board with the station's DEI efforts? The word gaslighting has has Hmm. come up a Hmm. lot. If you remember, an anonymous letter in 2019 charged that there was an atmosphere of racism and harassment at the station. And a lot of the specific allegations were aimed at executive director Kelly Wells, who who denied them. The board backed her then and it backs her now. But it's saying, in effect, that following that letter, the station has gone on a years long process of looking at its policies and trying to become more inclusive. And not everyone is on board with that. But by the way, all those specific allegations to 2019 are false. Now, that very well may be true, but it has DJs saying, wait, is, is management actually just weaponizing the language of DEI to just get rid of people that they don't want around anymore because they've been too critical? So why do DJs say that management is looking for reasons to get rid of them? Well, there has been a lot of criticism from DJs headed up to management. They say there's not enough transparency, there's very little influence over the composition of the board, that the board isn't responsive to listeners or to volunteers. On the air Saturday morning, uh, Itel K said there's a struggle between the, the old KDHX that listeners have known and loved and the leaders who don't seem to respect that or understand it. I've been telling you from a long time, it's two radio stations these people here dealing with. One that they see that serves them, and a next one that serves you, the community here in St. Louis, that donate and support it. Two visions. Which one of them you aren't? So what happens next? Some of the volunteers have called a meeting for Tuesday night. They hope to cast a vote of no confidence in some of the board and symbolically elect two replacements. St. Louis Public Radio's Jeremy Goodwin, who's been following the developments at KDHX. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you, Wayne. All this week, we are exploring the concept of home with help from NPR's Next Generation Radio Project. Today, we hear from Kevin Holler, a former IT professional who found a new home by pursuing his dream of becoming 
a full-time artist. Me being able to express my art kind of is a home, is a, creates a home feeling for me. That, that's how our art magnifies our sense of home. My name's Kevin Haller. I'm from St. Louis. I've spent most of my life here. I work for various companies in and around St. Louis and around the country. I started art when I was a teenager. I was really into hunting and fishing, and what got me started with art was they had art on the cover of fishing magazines, and I wanted to make a copy of that for my room. It was a, a fish chasing a lure under the water, which I thought was really cool that, you know, you couldn't, you can't take a photograph of that. You can't see it in person. The only way that comes to life is through art. It fascinated me. And uh, I picked up a paint set and copied the, the as best I could. And it turned out pretty good. And I, and I found out I really liked it. And I've been painting ever since. About a year and a half ago, I decided that I really wanted to pursue my art dream. And, you know, I'm not getting any younger, so I, I decided I'm just going to stop the IT. Even though it was a good career, I liked what I was doing. I got to meet a lot of people, worked on a lot of interesting projects. You know, I didn't leave it because I didn't like it, but I just wanted to pursue my art passion. This is my main studio, and I put my artwork, you know, like here. And, you know, you sort of attach it there. And then your paints are here and your brushes, solvent or walnut oil, things like that. And I have lovely light in this room. I know, you know, I've produced many paintings here. And so at this point, it's my home base and I'm very comfortable with creating paintings here. I like to paint the American West. My parents came from small family farms in the middle of Missouri and we were out on the farm a lot when I was young, even when I was a teenager. And I had a twin brother, and we used to roam around the farm all day long, every day. We were outside, roaming the countryside, having fun, finding adventure. And so I love that life. That, to me, seems like a really good way to live life. I spent a lot of time on the farm, and I do have paintings around the house of different scenes from the farm. I really do paint people's homes a lot. You know, I never really noticed that, but painting home and creating a feeling of home is a big part of my art. When my wife and I purchased this house, we saw this as, oh boy, what a nice sunroom, you know? And I sort of immediately thought of it as, oh, it's, it's a great art place. It's a little cluttered. You know, my wife and I are okay with that. There's a part of us that are very creative and, you know, we don't mind that people see the clutter that comes along with that. That's a sense of home for me. Kevin Haller is an Oakville-based artist. That report was produced by Mark Burbridge, one of the participants in the NPR Next Generation radio project. Members of that team were in St. Louis last week to produce stories that explore the concept of home. The Gateway is a production of St. Louis Public Radio, a listener-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. I'm Wayne Pratt. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.